now it's time for the next presentation in the IT Strategy Summit, and this session comes from Scale Computing. And presenting for Scale is David Demlo, who's Vice President of Product Strategy. David, welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me, and uh, thanks for everyone for joining. Yeah, thanks for being here, and uh, take it away. All right. Um, so uh, in, in this session, we really want to focus on uh, how in 2023 you can take control of your growing distributed edge computing infrastructure. All those uh, you know, systems and software and applications that are required to deliver new business value and you know, computer vision, AI, edge processing, supporting all those as well as handling all your you know, existing workloads that, that need to be managed across a, a distributed fleet. Uh, so I'll give you a little background on scale computing, a lot more available on our website, so we won't hit all the points. Uh, we've been a leader in providing hyper-converged or HCI solutions to the data, from the data center to the edge since 2012 uh, was when we first released our HCI product. We have a large number of customers, including many enterprise edge names that have distributed locations, which is the kind of use case that we're going to be focusing on here. Uh, we're headquartered in Indianapolis, Indiana. That's where I'm located. All of our R&D is in the San Francisco area. We have uh, some key partnerships in the hardware, software side, uh, and uh, we you know, want to talk about uh, a number of use cases uh, for edge computing and how you can uh, be in a position to rapidly deploy new applications that are going to demand localized edge computing and storage uh, while you know, taking control and, and, uh, of that infrastructure that, that's distributed. So some definitions for you, if you may not know, hyperconvergence or HCI uh, is just means integrating compute storage, virtualization, and infrastructure into a single solution architecture. So in our case, that means hardware, software, fully integrated. It's everything that you need to do to run applications, to manage the infrastructure, all built in as opposed to going and, you know, piecing a bunch of uh, hardware, software, and different systems together from, from multiple vendors. Our key product that you may hear is Scale Computing Hypercore. You may have also in the past heard the name HC3. They're the same products. So the current brand name is, is on Hypercore, focusing on the software portion of that. But again, it's hyperconvergence. And um, what we really have always focused on since day one is simplicity. So how do we make this infrastructure that needs to sit there uh, in, in whatever location, how do we make it simple, easy to manage, uh, easy to deploy, highly available where that's required, so you know, self-healing, being able to handle the inevitable hardware, software, network failures, um, available through things like disaster recovery as a service. If the entire site goes down, how you can easily, where it's applicable, repurpose and, and restart all those applications in a secondary location. Scalable, uh, which, which does mean for us everything from a single node. Not all applications require a clustered, resilient architecture. They may not start out needing that, but they may grow to need that. Uh, we can support applications running in a hyperconverged mode, hyperconverged mode on a single node, and then scale that out as uh, your applications grow, as your needs change. And we are in a unique thing that we really focus on interoperability, where you can mix and match nodes. And that's important for kind of evergreen operation. And we don't want you to buy a set of infrastructure, determine you need something different, you know, three, four years down the line and have to throw that all away and start over. You, um, we allow you to mix and match kind of the old capabilities, new capabilities, and, and evolve your, your edge fleet and systems as, uh, as appropriate. And then obviously it's got to be affordable. So we offer the complete stack, simple software licensing, uh, low cost, and, and uh, so forth. Um, what may be new for those of you who might be familiar with scale is scale computing platform. And that's the combination of, of two really key pieces, scale computing hypercore, which is the on-prem soft, software stack that, that drives the edge infrastructure that we just talked about, and a newer offering called Scale Computing Fleet Manager, which we're going to spend a lot of time talking about today. And that's, as you would imagine, that's the central control plane for managing a distributed fleet of hypercore systems uh, that, that may be in multiple locations. Uh, so to kind of get some context on who we have here, uh, this is our first poll question. Um, how many locations do you manage? And, and by locations, uh, you know, these would be, you know, any sites that have IT operations, that run application, uh, you know, retail stores, Ocean-going vessels is actually a use case we uh, uh, concentrate on quite a lot. Uh, manufacturing locations, uh, there a location may be a particular assembly line within a factory, but that has kind of an autonomous, isolated uh, environment. Uh, but anything that would require you to distribute, you know, IT, compute, and, and storage resources close to uh, the environment. I see some answers uh, coming in. Let me go ahead and uh, push those answers here. But uh, it's looking like a good distribution. We have several in the 500. Uh, plus site range. Uh, so, so, yeah, this is kind of what we'd expect. And, uh, I mean, 
you know, certainly in the hundreds uh, of sites, um, if you've got IT operations there, especially if these are locations where you, you don't have full-time IT resources or don't want to have full-time IT, uh, full IT resources, that can be very uh, unwieldy to manage. And even in the, you know, in the tens, um, you know, grocery store chains that, you know, have 10, 20, 30 locations but don't have IT people that um, are, are uh, on-prem to, you know, keep uh, infrastructure up and running is a, another example. So that's great. So let's talk about generally about edge computing, and I'm not going to go into a, a broad definition from, from the scale computing perspective. It's basically anything that's not in that core data center or cloud. So if it's in a well-managed uh, data center that either you run or you maybe call that a private cloud or a public cloud, um, if you've got, you know, IT resources and applications that require being run close to where, you know, people are interacting, where things are interacting, like machinery or devices, uh, where, um, you know, in some cases, smart devices like cameras that may actually have their own, uh, you know, code or embedded devices or, you know, so forth. Uh, you know, that is all edge computing. And there's, you know, obviously a spectrum from, you know, very far, small, tiny devices to gateways that collect lots of data, maybe provide on-premises processing to more sophisticated, getting into kind of a compute edge where you're doing inference uh, in real time, maybe inspecting uh, parts as they come off of an assembly line and you need, you know, microsecond uh, examination of those and decision making that's just not possible from sending large streams of images or video streams to a public cloud, getting a response back and so forth. That's, you know, those are the kinds of things that, that are driving uh, the need for edge computing, and in many cases for edge computing to be very, very close to where uh, the sources of that, that data uh, is. Uh, but edge computing introduces a number of challenges. These are just some of them, uh, but you know, ones that we hear commonly from our customers are just the diversity of systems that they have to deal with, the number of different kinds of applications, different kinds of sites in many cases. And so that, you know, presents everything from, you know, simple, dumb devices to PCs that have a little more intelligence but not much in terms of resiliency to fully resilient autonomous systems or clusters uh, that have their own, you know, management um, uh, challenges. Um, a lot of different pieces. And again, you know, this is where hyperconvergence and the degree of hyperconvergence can really be important, you know. Uh, do you have to deal with the bare metal operating systems on these things, with firmware on these devices? If you have, you know, a, a, a virtual virtualization environment that you built yourself, do you have to manage that hypervisor as a separate entity from the storage, from the management? Um, you know, things like container runtimes or Kubernetes uh, clusters, um, you know, all those different things that may be running your applications. Uh, dealing with not just the initial deployment on day one, but how do you patch those, you know, for security? How do you replace the hardware when it needs to be replaced or expanded? And then how do you scale those operations across uh, hundreds or thousands of sites? Um, we definitely see a lot of diversity in the applications. Uh, so in almost all environments, we see some mix of, you know, existing workloads, virtual machines, virtual appliances. A lot of these industries, it's still surprising, have, you know, hardware that, you know, relies, it's 20 years old, it relies on some specific ancient version of Windows that, you know, uh, that's the only thing that's certified to work with this pe particular piece of hardware and gather the data. So you've got those things, and then you've got, you know, newer uh, applications, cloud native being written in containers, maybe being written for Kubernetes, um, and managing all those without creating new different I islands of infrastructure that have to be managed. And then also in the edge, we see a lot of unique network connectivity challenges. And, and many of these are what drive these applications to need to be deployed onto the edge as opposed to being in a central cloud. Uh, you know, if there's latency uh, issues or just data volume or um, uh, privacy or compliance requirements. You know, we don't want to uh, transmit personally identifiable video information, you know, off, off site to a public cloud and have to deal with those security issues. Uh, introduces just a number of unique network connectivity challenges from, you know, how they're connected to intermittent unreliable connections to the cost, the, the latency, to re resiliency of the network. Um, all those things make edge environments all very unique and special and very different. Um, you know, a, a use case I'll probably mention a couple times throughout because this is one where uh, scale computing has a number of deployments is ocean-going vessels that have little data centers that, you know, they're out and they have, you know, either intermittent ne network connectivity, very high latency, lots of places where they just physically don't have connectivity at all. Uh, and then, um, uh, you know, in, in, in many cases, again, these are, are critical operations uh, that, you know, they can just rely on running these applications or having access to these applications over a remote network. 
So uh, getting back to the scale computing solution, I mentioned briefly, um, you know, and this is really the first step to gaining control of this distributed fleet is getting visibility. So how can you centrally monitor and manage an entire fleet? We built this scale computing fleet manager project uh, with the same level of simplicity built in that we built into the hyperconverged system. So we wanted to make it very, very easy to quickly see, um, you know, get centralized management for all your deployments, give you the ability to drill down. And by the way, this is a cloud-based solution. So you log in with, you know, single sign-on to this cloud-based system. Uh, get centralized management for all your systems, drill down from that full fleet view down to individual sites and systems, and even down to individual virtual machines. Get centralized, proactive alerting, highlighting any areas that need attention. And by need attention, uh, this isn't, hey, you need to go troubleshoot, you know, these logs. It's, you know, in the scale world, these are things that we've already triaged the site, you know, say it was a disk drive failure. Uh, this disk drive failed. We automatically evicted it from the node, so we re mirrored the data for full resiliency. Everything's up and fine, your applications are good, but you need to, next time somebody does go on site, you need to send a new replacement hard drive, or you know, same thing could be a replacement node in a you know, resilient cluster. Uh, so you know, things that, that, re that can't be resolved automatically, can't be resolved autonomously, uh, project those up through to, to the central um, fleet manager. Monitor individual hardware devices and health within the cluster, as well as you know VM status, and then provide where it's uh, required the ability to drill down into the individual sites, as I mentioned. A new thing that's being added into Fleet Manager is uh, even further simplifying the zero touch provisioning. Uh, so you know the old way uh, pre Fleet Manager would be you know you'd order systems, you'd maybe send them to an integrator or send them to your in house IT. They would set everything up in a lab, configure all sorts of IPs deploy applications, do all these kinds of things manually, then try to you know, do some testing, package it up and shut it down. With uh, scale computing platform and fleet manager and zero touch provisioning, as the systems are ordered, even before they've been delivered to remote sites, uh, the information about that system is, uh, and those nodes are present in your fleet manager console. You can go in and apply a desired configuration, including things like site specific IP addressing, uh, so forth, and then when those systems arrive on site, they're automatically set up to phone home to the fleet manager control plane, uh, get provisioned automatically, full status, full operation. You know, literally this was designed, uh, you know, so a retail store manager could plug in a power cable and an ethernet cable and, and go in many cases. Or, uh, you know, if they were pre-configured in a, you know, a small rack or whatever, send the rack, plug it in, and, and you know, very minimal uh, IT knowledge or skills required to get those set up. Um, so again, this avoids sending expensive IT resources, spending time, you know, staging environments, shutting them down, restaging them, so forth, eliminating the potential for human error, getting on a keyboard and typing in IP addresses in each of these and, and providing a, um, you know, the shortest time from, from pilot to production and then fleet deployment across a, a large number of sites. So Fleet Manager works with HyperCore, and again, um, HyperCore uh, is designed to be that hyperconverged platform that integrates your servers, your storage, the hypervisor to let you securely run multiple applications and workloads side by side, and those can be you know, e your legacy applications running in virtual machines, those can be virtual appliances, and they can also be modern applications such as you know, Docker containers, Kubernetes clusters, so on and so forth and all with that you know, central management and administration and everything that you need built in uh, to deploy your applications. Um, so one question we want to ask here is what automation and orchestration tools do you currently use um, in your environment? And this can be in your cloud environment, in your data center, in your edge environment, if you're doing automation uh, across the edge um, here. So we'll give a couple minutes for um, answers to come in. See some none. That's uh, that's sad and scary. We see some PowerShell. That's that's one of my uh, personal favorites. We see uh, some Terraform, some Ansible, some Puppet. That's uh, that's interesting. Uh, so it's good that that. Uh, well, I guess none is is uh, a little alarmingly high. But uh, but again, if you haven't really deployed these multi-edge site environments, you very quickly reach a barrier where doing things manually, manual staging, manual setup, manual application deployment, manual patching is uh, just not practical. Uh, so let me push the, the results here so everybody can see. So a lot of Windows PowerShell, and, and I will say PowerShell is a really amazing tool. Uh, Ansible, Bash, Terraform, pretty much what we uh, see across uh, a wide range of environments. So that's good to hear. 
Um, so one of the things we have just recently added, uh, so we have a full REST API um, in, in our product. So anything that you can do in the UI, you can orchestrate through a REST API. So PowerShell is a very, very commonly used uh, tool for that. We, have off, we offer sample code. And, and I will say PowerShell is very good at doing a set of tasks, a set of sequence of things on one site, one cluster. Um, where it's not good and where the tools like Ansible and I would put Terraform in this category are much better is when you want to do similar things across many, many sites um, and, uh, and, and you want it to be able to, done, to happen in a declarative way. You don't want to have to say for you go through these set of set steps over and over and over, uh, you want to be able to declare what each site should look like. These are the workloads that should, should be running. These are how they should be configured, so on and so forth. And have those have that uh, desire applied, and also have it remediated if something's caused it to be changed or dripped. So Ansible is a very good tool for that. And so we recently released um, a scale computing hypercore collection for Ansible. Uh, it's designed to provide provisioning of the virtual machines, configuration management, application deployment, and, and uh, as well as security into compliant patching. Um, and if you're not familiar with Ansible, it looks like a number of people are. It's really designed for IT operators. It does use some code artifacts, you know, YAML files that are, are human readable, but, but are not, you don't have to be a developer. It's a small learning curve. There's great automation tools around Ansible if you do want to use GUI-based tools and so forth. But really the key is it is declarative, so you don't have to say, do these things in, in this order and check for errors and so on and so forth. You just declare this is what each site should look like. These are the workloads. These are how they should be configured. Um, and apply the playbook, and it will you know, achieve that desired state. And say your desired intent was, I need these three applications, and they need to be configured this way. If um, one of them doesn't exist, it'll recreate it. It has all the information in the Ansible playbook to recreate that, reconfigure it, start that. Uh, if something has changed, like maybe somebody shut down a VM, we hear this commonly, a contractor came in, did some work, and decided it was a good idea to shut off one of the, the workloads, it would restart that. Um, and um, uh, one of the key things is that it's item potent, which means you can run these playbooks over and over, and if there's nothing, if it's already in the desired state, it'll just say, I'm fine, there's nothing else to do. So it's a very good tool for applying infrastructure as code, a set of um, you know, declarative statements about what every site should look like, and doing that automate, uh, in an automated fashion. Uh, it's also great because it's open source. There are free tools as, as well as some paid supported tools, and uh, there's a large ecosystem of other collections uh, that you can use to manage other things other than your edge infrastructure. So if you need to automatically configure networking, there's Ansible modules to do that. If you need to uh, you know, manage third-party software or clouds, uh, there's a large ecosystem that, that uh, leverages Ansible for that, which is why we, we chose that uh, for our uh, orchestration, uh, our initial orchestration. And by the way, other tools like Puppet, and Chef, and, and Terraform can use Ansible very, very easily uh, as well. And if we get you know, sufficient demand, we'll look at you know, native modules for, for those as well. Uh, so what analysts are saying about, you know, this general approach, um, you know, management at scale is very difficult, especially across an edge fleet. We've solved it with uh, the technologies that we're providing here today. And really other vendors who are, you know, saying, hey, we're the infrastructure for the edge are, are really comparing themselves to the kinds of capabilities that, that we're providing uh, for customers uh, out of the box today. Uh, so just a quick view at our uh, hardware product line. So as I mentioned, we do uh, distribute as an appliance. So we have everything from micro edge systems to large GPU loaded, uh, all NVMe systems, depending on what you need at your edge or what you need at your, your regional or central data center. Um, so, and, and including even uh, cloud-based instances for things like DR as a service and so forth. So our goal is really to provide that, that wide range of, of infrastructure uh, that's needed. And this is just a dupe. And, um, you know, very highly awarded both by customers, partners, uh, vendors, uh, analysts, and so forth. Um, and uh, we look forward to helping you with your uh, EDGE journey in 2023. Uh, I guess any, uh, let me look at the, some questions here. Or um... Yep. Yeah, we got some questions. Great presentation there, Dave. Um, and uh, while we see what questions we got, we'll, I'll just put up the poll question. Uh, we appreciate your answers on what additional information you'd like from scale computing. But so, uh, first question here: um, What are the primary drivers for running applications on premises at the distributed edge versus in the public cloud? What do you, what do you see out there? Sure. Yeah, and, and I mean, many many applications can and should run in, in the public cloud. I mean, we see the drivers for edge. You know, often. Um, 
Well, a lot of cases, it's, uh, you know, it can be the network. You know, it's an unreliable network. We're, we're notion going vestible or, or lots of countries, you know, getting reliable, low latency Internet connectivity um, is, you know, impossible or costly, especially with, with redundancy. Um, in many cases, it is just the latency. Like I said, there's a lot of applications where the round trip time of sending, you know, high resolution video imagery, imagery data to a public cloud, doing some AI inferencing on that, getting a response back that says, hey, this, this part that just came off the, the production line, um, you know, is a defect, you need to, you know, kick it out. That, those kinds of things, uh, you know, self-checkout in a retail store, um, you know, safety analysis in a manufacturing machine, you know, somebody's walked into an area they're not supposed to be without a helmet, things like that. Those things all require low, you know, instantaneous um, uh, decision-making. We use a lot of data to, to process to, uh, you know, make those kinds of uh, AI inferencing using, you know, computer vision. Uh, so those are, you know, a common class. Some of them also, you know, uh, relate to cost of, you know, the cost of bandwidth, the cost of the cloud compute resource, uh, I think I mentioned early on data sovereignty in some cases. We're not going to, you know, take personally identifiable, identifiable information. Uh, many countries that's illegal. You can't, you know, ship Im imagery of a, of a person uh, off premises or, or things like that. Uh, so those tend to be a lot of the uh, the drivers that, that we see for that versus public cloud. Okay. All right. Fantastic. Um... Next question has to do with uh, Fleet Manager. They're asking, is there a limit to how many clusters I can manage through uh, Scale Computing's Fleet Manager? Uh, the published limit I've heard is around 50,000 sites, and I think that's more of just a we've you know tested that uh, you know uh, you know that many endpoints so forth. Uh, it is a multi-tenant application, so we actually have many many customers you know running in the hundreds of you know or even thousands of sites. Uh, and nodes, so, uh, but yeah, the, that's the design goal, and, and uh, uh, so for most people, not a, not a concern. Yeah, you talked about this a little bit, but, you know, I'm, I'm just curious what kind of fleets uh, people commonly use them on. You know, you mentioned, you mentioned ships, um, you know, is, is trucking common? I mean, what are some of the other, uh, like, types of fleets that, that are uh, sort of common use cases? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, uh, retail stores, I mean, you know, hundreds, thousands of, you know, nearly identical, you know, retail stores. Uh, there may be some variations on, hey, this is a grocery store chain, and these set of stores have a pharmacy app versus point of sale, you know, maybe some different applications depending on, you know, different store types. We see a lot uh, of, you know, these highly distributed environments there. Um, entertainment, hospitality uh, is another one. And I, and I guess another specific use case, and this would go to Edge, uh, is video surveillance and access control. I mean, these are one thing. Mm -hmm. That's an application we tend, tend to see in resale, we see in hospitality, uh, you know, the, the, the processes that are looking at the camera streams in real time, um, uh, you know, doing, you know, people detection, um, you know, all, all the different kind of computer vision applications that come out of that. Uh, so hospitality, manufacturing is another area uh, where we see, again, many times it is multiple locations, but a lot of times it is just different assembly lines, different machines. And sometimes these machines throw so much data that they're almost an edge location on their own. You know, trying to even centralize that within a data center somewhere within a large factory floor uh, can be impractical versus, well, let's just process and gather, you know, analyze the information close to the machine, get the results, the, you know, infer the uh, usable data that we need out of that, and then, you know, send that off to some central location or to a public cloud. Uh, so those tend to be the kinds of, uh, you know, fleets where we see lots of, Highly similar, you know, distributed environments in, in different locations. Quick serve restaurants, I guess, would be another one. You know, kind of another retail type environment. Super. Um, hey, we had a question here from Philip, who's wondering where's the sweet, or where would the sweet spot be uh, regarding total number of endpoints in, in this tool? The sweet spot. That's a good. Um, I mean, we we have customers that get a lot of value. I mean, first of all. I mean, Hypercore at one site, you know, if, if, that's, if that's where you need to run your processing, that's your sweet spot then. I mean, if it's, uh, it really does depend on, um, and, and it's designed to be an easy-to-manage autonomous system. I mean, that's why even before we added this central fleet management, we had customers who had Hypercore systems running autonomously with, you know, just email notifications when something was wrong, um, you know, at tens or hundreds of sites. So the fleet manager was designed to be that central portal, uh, and again, whether you have you know, five sites, ten sites, hundred sites, or a thousand sites, uh, it's designed to let you see just what you need, just what needs attention. And then it is also the point going forward of, 
you know, the control plane of, of when you really get to the, that level and maybe this is the sweet spot part. When, when do you get big enough where doing things manually one at a time uh, becomes, you know, cost prohibitive, impractical, uh, error prone? Um, to be honest, I mean, it's, you know, more than one, um, you know, can, can vary in, in many cases be that, that sweet spot. But uh, clearly I think once you get into, you know, the tens of things, uh, and and you want to do it with a small number of IT people, being able to have a system that is smart enough to run itself, can be centrally managed, where you can declaratively say, these are what all these sites should be doing, these are the applications that, that should be running, these are how I update the infrastructure, how I update the applications, and be able to you know centrally define that and push that out as opposed to doing those things man manually, um, you know, the, the ROI uh, is, it becomes huge very quickly. Okay, yeah, great. Um, you mentioned Hypercore in there. What types of applications uh, can people run on, on SC Hypercore? Uh, I mean, you know, really anything. I mean, from Windows virtual machines, Linux uh, virtual machines, uh, virtual appliances, you know, common you know, network appliances, you know, firewalls, things like that, uh, containers, Docker runtimes, Kubernetes clusters, and, you know, and then any, any kinds of things that, that you would run on that. Uh, but, you know, I mean, these are line of business apps, database apps if needed. Um, uh, you know, file server, file storage apps are very common. I mean, in a lot of industries, you know, well, pretty much everybody needs some files, and in some cases you need more robust, you know, file sharing or synchronization. We, you know, those kinds of things run, um, you know, uh, can run on Hypercore, and we have partnerships with a lot of vendors that, that provide those kinds of things. Um, you know, infrastructure apps like Backup, that has to run somewhere. In some cases you can run those, you know, alongside uh, your other workloads as well. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Great. Um, probably time for one more. Uh, we're asking where does HCI fit at the edge? Yeah. Um, I, well, I think uh, first it does depend on your definition of, of HCI, but I think you know HCI. Uh, clearly, if you're looking to build a centralized platform that can run in, instead of having you know piece part, I want you know here's a device for this app, here's another device for this app, and all the management that comes along with that. If you basically want to run, you know, a cloud-like managed environment at the edge with resiliency where it's needed, with the you know, automatic failover, with storage redundancy, um, you know, then HCI, I think, in, in you know, all forms is, is a good thing to consider uh, because you can centralize all that on some single thing to manage. Then you need to look at the characteristics of your HCI. Uh, one of the things that we find and that is unique to scale is we are very resource efficient, which is you know, why we can run on these very small form factor devices, very inexpensive hardware. A lot of edge applications, if it's a few containers and, you know, a couple of Windows apps, you don't need a terabyte of RAM for sure. Matter of fact, you're probably good with 16 gig of RAM, especially if you've got multiple nodes that are clustered together for resiliency. So we made it, you know, a big emphasis on being very, very resource efficient so that, you know, uh, we can run on small hardware and retain a very small amount for overhead for, you know, our software stack versus, running your application. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I think that and, and then our ability to give all the same capability even if you're running a single node. Like I mentioned, not everyone needs the same level of resiliency at the edge or in some cases maybe your application has its own resiliency. You know, maybe, uh, maybe you're running it on the edge as, as a cache but you're able to fail back to a cloud or fail back to something running in a, a corporate data center. In that case, you may not need the same level of hardware resiliency. You just want the centralized management. You want the zero touch provisioning so you don't have to roll a truck out to each of those locations if something breaks. Um, you know, that, we would still consider that HCI even in a single node configuration. And, and so we, we, it was an important thing for us to provide kind of that continuum as well. Okay. Well, uh, David Demo, I think we're gonna have to leave it there, but thank you so much for coming on and uh, bringing us up to speed on, on scale computing. Yeah, thanks very much, and thanks for uh, joining, everyone.